Today we're going to talk about Eric Arthur Blair, aka George Orwell. George Orwell is said to be, by some, the greatest author of the 20th century. And he wrote two of the most influential books, which are often required reading in high schools and colleges, 1984 and Animal Farm, both of which are political treaties. And uh, it's interesting because in this little book, Why I Write, there's a 10-page little autobiographical sketch that he wrote up about why he writes and what he thinks about authors and why authors write what they do. And he says that there's four reasons why authors write. One is sheer egoism. He says that they want to be distinguished. They want to make their mark in the world. He says after the age of about 30, um, most human beings abandon individual ambition. In many cases, indeed, they almost abandon the sense of being individuals at all and live chiefly for others or are simply smothered under drudgery. Uh, but there is also the minority of gifted, willful people who are determined to live their own lives to the end, and writers belong to this class. So um, he saw himself as that way, that he was going to make something of himself in the world, and the way he lived his life really goes along with that idea that he was an egoist and was determined to make something of himself. He says the second reason is aesthetic enthusiasm, perception of beauty in the external world is another reason authors write, historical impulse, which is the desire to see things as they are and to find out true facts and store them up for the use of posterity, and for his political purpose, using political in the widest possible sense, the desire to push the world in a certain direction, to alter other people's ideas of the kind of society they should strive after. Um, that's what he saw as his driving purpose. He says, um, he said that of those four, where is it? Oh, I can't find it. Anyway, he says of those four, it was the last one, when he finally found himself and he found what he believed was his politics, his approach to the world, his belief about what society should be, that he really began to write the most powerfully. Um, Animal Farm was the first book in which I tried, with full consciousness of what I was doing, to fuse political purpose and artistic purpose into one whole. I have not written a novel for seven years, but I hope to write another fairly soon. It is bound to be a failure. Every book is a failure, but I know with some clarity what kind of book I want to write. So this was near the end of his life. He had published Animal Farm in 44, and 1984 was published in um, 49, right before he died. So um, maybe even after... I can't remember how that played out exactly, but um, yeah, he, it was published just a few months before he died. He says that writing a book is a horrible, exhausting struggle, like a long bout of some painful illness. One would never undertake such a thing if one were not driven on by some demon whom one can neither resist nor understand. So this little, this little tidbit, which I don't know if you can find it online or not, this is a Penguin's book that they've put this in why I write. It's very, it's a very interesting little autobiographical sketch. The next thing in this book, The Lion and the Unicorn, Socialism and the English Genius, he wrote in 1941 as um, to the English, to the, to, the, to the people of Great Britain who were right in the middle of World War II, and he was trying to convince them that if they were going to win the war against Hitler, that they needed a socialist revolution. He became purely socialistic in his later life, was a democratic socialist, and um, that was kind of the conclusion that he came to about how mankind could be saved and, and how we could solve the problems of the world. Now, he had a strange childhood. Um, he was born in India, but soon thereafter his mom took him and his older sister back to England to live separately from his father until he was eight years old. And he only saw him once when he was four. And then at eight, they got a little um, partial scholarship for him. And he went to boarding school for five more years. 
So he never really saw his dad as a child, didn't have much of a relationship when he was younger, although I think they reestablished something a little bit later on. That had an impact on his future life. So he did okay at school, he was at Eton, he didn't shine, he wasn't going to get a scholarship, he quit. He became um, part of the Imperial Police, went and worked back in India, and uh, or Burma, and uh, didn't like it, quit, came back home, and then decided to go to Paris to live with the underclass and see what that was like. Uh, he went to work, he went to live in the working class district, and... Um, he became really ill, spent some time in a poor hospital, and then had all of his money stolen. And then he took up a whole bunch of menial jobs to get by dishwashing and things like that before he went home. And then when he went back home, he lived at home for the next five years, um, basically was supported by his family, either his parents or extended relatives, most of his adult life. He was always a writer. He says of himself, from a very early age, perhaps the age of five or six, I knew that when I grew up I should be a writer. Between the ages of about 17 to 24, that's when he quit college and went to work in the Imperial Police and came home. I tried to abandon this idea, but I did so with the consciousness that I was outraging my true nature and that, the soon, and that sooner or later I should have to settle down and write books. Which, of course, is what he did. He spent his whole life trying to establish himself as a writer. But he went about it in a really strange way. One of the people that he really looked up to was Jack London. And I've attached a little article here that Jack Leonard wrote. It's really, it's like an autobiographical sketch, and it's called Why I'm a Socialist, or How I Became a Socialist, or something like that. Really interesting to read, because he really looked up to Jack London, and he had some of those same experiences, but self-imposed. So, while he was in Paris, he lived among the working class, and his first published article was called the, um, what did they call it? A, I can't remember what they called it, but it was a word for a workhouse. And then when he came back, he would go tramping or slumming in the London slums. And he would go and dress up like he was poor. And then he would go down there and hang out with people from there and ask them questions and get to know them. He did this all his life. He did it later on in Manchester. He lived in this dirty kind of hole above this house and he went and visited poor people and he went to the public library and studied the public records of the area. It was, he was just, he wanted to understand the lower class and why they live the way that they live. Now he can never quite fully identify with them because he always had family to fall back on. There was always a fallback for him, unlike the actual real working class, the, the, the poor underclass of society, because they didn't have anybody to turn to. And when times were hard, times were just hard. Um, he had society and his family and money to go back to. They were never really wealthy, but they were, they were established. He was always fine. Anyway, really interesting. One time, in fact, he, um, he got drunk and he caused some rockers or something because he was trying to get himself arrested because he wanted to spend Christmas in prison. <laughs> So he, this was his great social experience, experiment. He wanted to do and be and experience all these things. From the time he was in Paris through the rest of his life, he became increasingly ill. And some people speculate that these were actually illnesses that were contracted because some of the living conditions that he was in. And, and he weakened his body and he was more and more ill the longer he lived. Oh, they were called spikes. So it was, it was the workhouses were spikes, and, and he, this first article that he published was called The Spikes. So he put together this book, Down and Out in Paris and London, that was a, that was a compilation of his experiences in the, among the working class in Paris and in London. And he tried to get it published for a while, and finally um, it was. But he didn't want his family to be embarrassed because it told all about his tramping. And I'm not sure how much they, I don't think they knew a whole lot about how he had been living and that he had been doing this. And so he took on a, pseudo, a, a, a literary name for himself to protect his family from embarrassment. And he chose George Orwell because he said that was a good British name. So he became George Orwell. That was in 1932. He was 29 years old when that book was officially published. Well... He met his wife. Uh, he had, his life was really interesting because it's kind of one of a, a lot of tragedy and some of it self-imposed. He, he proposed to a couple of girls. They turned him down. He met his wife. They finally got married. They were married in 36. 
And so he was in his 30s, he was been at 33, and, and the, the Spanish Civil War broke out and he wanted to go fight. So he left her, she followed him, but he left her to go fight in the Spanish Civil War. When he showed up, he said, I've come to fight against fascism. And he developed some ideas about why that happened, which is why he later wrote to the British uh, population this, this article about how they needed socialism. He had kind of decided that was his political and, and sociological stance uh, through these experiences. So when he was in the Spanish Civil War, he was struck by a bullet in the throat, and they cauterized it, and he was he was unfit for uh, military duty from then on. And, and military duty was kind of his fallback. Two or three different times he tried to get back into the military because it was the only way he had ever really been able to provide for himself and his family. So he was he was unfit for military service. So his wife is working. He writes Animal Farm. They're really pretty destitute. He's ill. He fought, he, nobody wants to publish it because it's right in the middle of World War II, and it's obviously very anti-Soviet Russia, which is their big ally in the war, so nobody wants to get Russia on their bad side. Nobody wants to publish it. Finally, they do. Finally, he gets a publisher, and um, it's published in 44. Well, right about this time, he and his wife have been married, this would have been about eight years, and uh, apparently they can't have kids, so they decide they're going to adopt this little baby boy. They, they figure it out, they work it out, it's wonderful, they get him, they settle down, and and they think, you know, he's just published a book, it's starting to be popular, um, it wasn't as popular as 1984, it was the really big one, but um, anyway, so they're going to kind of make it. So he becomes a war correspondent, because he really wants to work in the war. This was in 45, you know, the, the, the World War II is about to end. His wife has been having pain, and she's seen a doctor, and she needs a hysterectomy, but she doesn't tell Orwell because she thinks she's going to go in, and she's going to heal up quickly, and it's not going to be a big deal, and she thinks he might have a problem with it because it's going to be really expensive. So he leaves in 45. They have this brand new baby that they've adopted. He's a war correspondent. She goes in to have a hysterectomy, and she dies after the surgery. I mean, his life is like when he was, when he was in the hospital in the Spanish Civil War, all of his things were stolen again. I mean... Like, one tragedy to another. Some of them self-imposed, but really so, so, so sad. So he's got this baby boy. He comes home. He doesn't spend a lot of time with his son. He's kind of raised by nurses. This is 45. He's dead by 49. So his boy's really little. He has hardly any memories of his dad. And he proposes, after his wife died, he proposes to a string of women who all turn him down. And then... He's really, really ill. He's in and out of sanatoriums, and um, he's he's um, he's got tuberculosis, and um, so he he's trying to finish 1984, and he finally gets it done. He's in the sanatorium to try to heal up. This is the end of uh, by 49, October 49. He marries Sonia Brownwell. She takes care of him, and then there's this big row between, well, at first it's just between, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's over this corporation that receives the funds from his, from Orwell's books, and by the time, uh, within, a, within a, a short amount of time after Orwell died, well, so this is October 49, he dies at the end of the year, he dies like two or three months later. And this guy, by the time Sonia sees what's going on, has taken over 75% of the ownership of this company, and so it's this big row, and it's this big problem after his death. So it's really quite tragic. But he dies in, in, in 49, and 1984 is published that year. He's 46 years old. He's a very fascinating character. I've linked a biography um, for you to watch. You can read the article from Jack London. Why I Write is very worth reading. Uh, especially the little autobiographical sketch, but get to know him. He's an important 20th century figure who was a socialist who, who re, you know, Republicans think he's writing for them. He's writing for socialists. Really fascinating to understand all that. Anyway, uh, George Orwell, see you next time.